Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Jeanette Stanziano, and I am the um, Director of Education and Training for the New York State Association of Counties. I'd like to welcome you to our program on county aging departments launching new programs to help older Americans. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to participate in this important webinar. Today's presentation from the Association on Aging in New York will discuss new initiatives that can help your county enhance services for older Americans. Executive Director Becky Preve, our webinar speaker, will provide this critical information for county leaders, including a review of the enacted budget and the significant investments in aging services. Before we begin, I just want to give you a couple of housekeeping measures to be aware of. Number one, um, as we do with all of NYSEC webinars, we will be recording this program and posting it to the NYSEC website under webinars in our archive section about an hour after the program today. You will find a recording and you will also find a PDF of the slide deck. So feel free to visit NYSEC.org, then just click on webinars. I'd also like to encourage you to submit questions during the broadcast. By doing so, we ask that you do this through um, a written submission through your dashboard. Just click on the tab that says questions, type in your question at any time, and we will get to it during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. I'd now like to introduce our speaker for today. Becky Preve is the Executive Director of the Association on Aging in New York. They are a member organization representing the 59 area agencies on aging, and their mission of the association is to support and enhance the capacity of New York's local area agencies on aging and to work in collaboration with the Aging Network to promote independence preserve dignity, and advocate on behalf of aging New Yorkers and their families. I'd like to turn the floor over now to Becky. Thank you so much, Jeanette. And I just want to start by saying I'm so thankful to NYSAC for their partnership um, under Steve's leadership. I work very closely with the team on legislative priorities, and Jeanette does a fantastic job on these webinars. So i um, really excited to be here. There's a lot I'm going to go through in a fairly quickly manner that are really, really important to the localities as far as changes in the state budget, but also um, the aging network in and of itself. So we already know that, you know, New York State sits fourth in the nation as far as those over the age of 60. We know in the next 20 years we're going to see overall population only increase by about 3%. But what that means for offices for the aging through the network is that the fastest growing segment of the population are those 60 and over. So it's really timely that we talk about aging services and how it spills into other county departments and in the work that all of you do. Next, please. So I wanted to start with the Master Plan on Aging initiative because this did become a part of the state of the state. And it's something that we're working very closely with the governor's office and Department of Budget on. And I really wanted to just get this in front of everyone to see where we are, where we're going, and what a master plan on aging really means for New York State, and especially at the county level, what that will mean for implementation for all of you. Next slide. So I wanted to give a little bit of background because I have heard reference to the master plan on aging as being something new and innovative and that we are modeling it after the state of California, which did this a few years back. But really to do a level set, the master plan on aging is something that's really been in the works for about 16 years um, and just wanted to give a little bit of a refresher on what that really meant. So when we talk about age friendly New York, when we talk about health across all policies, we're really looking not just at aging networks, but we're looking across agencies. And what that means is that aging doesn't live in the state office for the aging. Aging touches all of the work that all of you do across departments. Um, we also work really closely for public-private partnerships, and that is really to address population health, overall uh, community health, age-friendly communities, and really making New York State the, really the premier place to grow up and grow old. The reason that that's important is the economic impact of older New Yorkers is the backbone of our economy. They have social security, they have pensions, they are the biggest givers to philanthropy, they're our volunteer base. So it's really important to make a state where we want older people to reside 
Um, and when we talk about the services that we provide, you know, we don't just assist people that need help. We also assist people in volunteer activities, healthy aging initiatives, et cetera, for overall population health. Um, so really what we're advocating for through the Aging Network with our partners at AARP, just to name a few, is to really make sure that this is a coordinated effort that doesn't just sit under Department of Health or sit under New York State Office for the Aging, but really more of a cabinet level position to drive policy across all of those service spectrums. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the things in the state budget that really fit into the goals of an age-friendly state and the master plan on aging. Next. So I wanted to go over a few of the age-friendly initiatives that we already have um, that we're really working on positively impacting older New Yorkers. So really looking at health and social services infrastructures on how we can promote better interagency connectivity. What that means is the, at the local level is, you know, does your Office for the Aging have a strong relationship with your public health department, your transportation department, your department of social services? Are we, you know, really utilizing referral networks to get people the right care at the right place for the right cost? Um, are our customers knowledgeable about the services that are available to them? Um, really with the overall goal of helping older people live in the community in the least restrictive setting. The reason that's really important from a budget standpoint is that we know our especially in our home care service infrastructure, we're serving non-Medicaid eligible individuals. So they're in that gray area where they don't make enough money to privately pay for home care services, but they don't qualify for Medicaid and we support them with subsidized services. When we look at what that means for people that we can't turn services on uh, based on budget or infrastructure, we know that 10% of people waiting for services in New York State go directly to a skilled nursing facility. Another 7% spend down to MLTC or community-based Medicaid. And what that means for the state, because we are a very high state share Medicaid service delivery system, um, is that just on the eight to 9,000 people that are waiting for services in New York, the state share on Medicaid for those that go to a nursing home is about $60 million. So overall, our services actually save healthcare dollars and Medicaid dollars. Um, we also look at policies related to environment, agriculture, housing, transportation, energy. How can we make our parks and recreation accessible to older people? How can we provide economic development opportunities um, that really target physical, economic, and social environments? And really all of these fall under the principles of smart growth and sustainable development, um, which we're, we stand very strongly behind. And obviously we wanna improve health outcomes and we wanna create age-friendly communities where people can age in place. Um, so you may have seen this in a lot of the downtown revitalization that's happened. Um, really, those have positive physical and mental health impacts on all of New York State, but specifically the older population who can then access community goods and services if they might use mobility um, assistance. So we are already part of the AARP World Health Organization age-friendly designation, but we're continuing to build on that in the state's prevention agenda. Next. So I wanted to just go really briefly through the prevention agenda. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this. Uh, public health departments have been really ingrained in it, um, but really looking at reducing health disparities. And we look at racial, ethnic, disability, low socioeconomic groups, and then populations who experience, experience those disparities. Um, and really we're trying to make progress across all of these measures and include the priorities related to improving older adult outcomes. So it's really, it, again, it's not just one service infrastructure, it's all of us. Um, again, we look at public policies, we look at harmful effects and overall population health, health equity, and really look at health consideration in our policies, programs, and initiatives, and those from non-health agencies. So they're all really overlapping um, with the same goal, which is to have a, a healthy, place to grow old and grow up. Um, we also have the state issued executive order 190. Many of the counties that are probably on this call are part of the um, EO 190 that, that designate your county as age friendly and having liv livability elements in state planning, your procurement and DRI embedded language in your grant making. Next. So again, I wanted to talk about some of the state level partnerships that we've seen that absolutely can trickle down to a county level. So New York State Office for the Aging, Department of State and Department of Health have funded multiple counties to sign on to the age friendly designation. Um, it's not hard to do this. If you do have an interest after this webinar, feel free to reach out to me and we can have further conversation. We also funded a partnership with the Health Foundation of Western and Central New York and created five regional age friendly centers of excellence. Again, these are not 
overly difficult to do, but it's very good for your county um, to be deemed an age-friendly center of excellence or part of the EO 190. Um, again, New York State has already established the Alzheimer's Disease Coordinating Council, Geriatric Behavioral Health Council, Food and Hunger Council, Geriatric Mental Health Council, the Most Integrated Setting Care Coordinating Council, Suicide Prevention Council, and these are just to name a few. Um, also new in this state budget is the uh, Office of Rural Health, which um, is getting up and running. And then there is also the Reimagine Long-Term Care Task Force that has been stood up um, and current appointments are going through with, with the governor's office. Um, again, we're working on age-friendly health system designation. What that means for some of you here is you have hospitals in your region that have actually signed up with Haney's to become an age-friendly health system. Um, and that's really working on making sure our hospitals and our primary care physicians are really in tune with what matters to older people and how to motivate change. Um, we are also working on the development of dementia-friendly communities. Um, again, we know from, from anecdotal evidence as well as, as data that people don't want to go to skilled nursing facilities. So how can we keep them in homes and communities successfully? Next. So now the exciting part, um, and I know many of you saw a, a very different state budget in this iteration than we've seen in the past. Um, I did wanna talk about what the aging services budget looks like, but also what other line items in other departments that can impact aging services in your community. Next. Um, so again, I'm not gonna go through this in a ton of detail. What I can tell you is these are some of our core state programs, which had been flat funded for uh, years and years and years. We did see some um, cost of living adjustments as well as some small base increases in these core programs and services. And again, each, each of your localities provide these services. Um, the, the one that we're very excited about is the long-term care ombudsman program, which again, we were only serving about 20% of skilled nursing facilities. Then the pandemic happened, we lost most of our volunteers who, who were older themselves. And then everyone knows the issues we saw in skilled nursing facilities during the pandemic. So we were very excited that we were able to advocate and get included an additional 2.5 million for that program. Department of Health also received an investment for the long-term care ombudsman program at the state level in order for them to be able to investigate claims of any um, fraud, abuse issues at skilled nursing facilities. And we're really hoping to get to a capacity where older people that reside in skilled nursing facilities have an outside advocate um, to really make sure they're getting appropriate treatment at their facilities. Next. Um, some of the other line items that we're very, very excited about that we know work um, are naturally occurring retirement communities. These are predominantly downstate. Um, but they absolutely assist older people to be able to remain at home. And really what a NORC does is it is a place where older people reside, where they receive um, many health and social services supports in their own homes and in their own communities. And so we did receive almost a million dollars in investment into the NORC program. Um, many localities actually fund their NORC programs as well. So we know they're tried and true, and it's something we'd like to see continue and, and expand in the future. Um, respite services are extremely important. Um, we provide respite in the home. We also use social adult daycare centers. We also do a ton of work on elder abuse initiatives. Again, financial exploitation is a huge issue in New York State. It costs um, the state billions of dollars every year. Um, many of you have enhanced multidisciplinary teams within your county structure, which really brings together all service providers to talk about elder abuse interventions and um, actually review cases on how you can bring them forward for prosecution and to get um, retribution back for those individuals that were stolen from. We also provide the Health Insurance Information Counseling and Assistance Program. The really important nuance of our HICAP program as it's known is that we have to provide um, completely objective information. So none of, none of your offices for the aging can you know, tell a client that they need to take a, a certain plan um, like commission sales reps can do. So we have to give objective information. We have to work with individuals to make sure they're in the correct plan. Um, and that, that program puts tons of money back into uh, the state every year on making sure people are in the appropriate plan. Um, we're really, really proud of the $23 million to support additional service capacity. Many of you will remember uh, we were able to advocate and obtain an additional $15 million in unmet need uh, four budget cycles ago. Last year, we were also able to look at our waiting lists um, and calculate what the cost to support individuals that were waiting for services, and we, we received an additional $8 million. 
So that's a $23 million executive addition that has been recurring for the past four years that we're very excited about. We also got an additional $750,000 that, that uh, is sub-allocated to NISOFA from DFS, and that's to expand the bill payer programs that combat elder abuse and financial exploitation. And that's gonna be done in up to 10 counties. It's still in the works on, on what that will look like moving forward. But these were really significant investments that are gonna help your community-based partners provide services to older residents. Next. So this is the really fun part of what I get to talk about, and this is something we have, we have not seen in the state budget before. Um, as many of you know, the way that we provided services and supports to the aging um, network really changed during the pandemic. And what we were able to do in conjunction with New York State Office for the Aging and many of the counties on the call were to expand innovative programs that we then pilot tested during COVID. Um, and then had a legislative and executive budget asked during the budget cycle to get them included, and they were included in the executive budget, so we expect these to be recurring allocations. Um, we got $2.9 million for um, social isolation and other expanded innovations, and I, I kind of wanted to walk through them in case you aren't aware of them at, at maybe a leadership level, uh, but I can tell you offices for the aging throughout the state have been doing these and supporting these programs and services, and we have gotten wonderful feedback um, on the impact that they have had. So many of you know about our animatronic pet initiative, so that started back pre-pandemic. It was actually piloted in a handful of counties who um, then tracked individuals that adopted one of these companion pets to see if it reduced their social isolation and loneliness. We found in the pilot it reduced it by 70%. Um, we, were, we were very humbled that New York State Office for the Aging distributed about 4,000 of these animals during the pandemic. And uh, we additionally got $350,000 in the New York State budget to, to make a mass purchase of these animals. For those of you that haven't seen them, they're very easy to find online at Joy for All Pets. They're, they're very lifelike cats and dogs that interact with an individual. Um, if they have a hearing impairment, you can feel the cat purr. Um, they will respond and react to you as you pet them. The cat will meow, roll over. You can feel the dog's heartbeat. And then if you don't touch them for a while, they'll actually go to sleep. So um, very easy to use. We have, we have gotten immense feedback on these. They were actually just uh, shown on the Today Show about two weeks ago. Um, to highlight the impact that they've had on older individuals. This iteration, we're also actually adding what's called a walker squawker. And what the walker squawker is, is it's a bird that you place on your walker to remind people not to leave a walker behind. Um, so we're excited for that. We also launched the Get Set Up online course program. Um, really, really amazing partnership with a California-based company. They actually have over 600 online classes that are taught by older people and they are super easy to use. Um, we did receive some pushback from people saying, you know, older people don't use technology. That's absolutely not true. Um, they're about 20% behind the general population, but we, after the launch of this, this platform, um, served over 100,000 people with online classes, and that was in one year. So we're gonna expand that program moving forward. This is free to anybody in your community. Um, so again, we're, we're really excited about the courses. We've gotten great feedback. We also are working with GoGo -Go Grandparent. I know many of you struggle with transportation. It's an ongoing theme that it is, you know, one of the number one issues that counties have. Um, and this is, again, a California-based company that is based on the Uber and Lyft model, but they have specialized individuals who actually provide the tr transportation, um, who have been trained and are comfortable with mobility issues or people that have cognitive impairments. And over the course of the next year, we're going to launch a public advocacy campaign, and we're also going to recruit drivers to expand transportation services across the state. Um, we also just launched, as of yesterday, a caregiver training and support platform called Trualta. It is amazing. It's user-friendly. It's free of charge to any New Yorker that's a caregiver. Um, and it has bite-sized training programs. You can listen to a 15-minute podcast. You can get further information depending on what your issues may be. Um, and this is something, again, any caregiver in New York State can have access to, and it is a, an evidence-based program that we're super excited to support. We're about to launch what's called LEQ. Um, we're really, really excited about this opportunity. It is an amazing piece of technology that is, um, I like to call it an Alexa on steroids. So it is voice operated, it's smart technology, and um, it comes with a 17-inch tablet and um, 
the nice thing about LEQ is that it has artificial intelligence. So it learns along with you and will recognize patterns. So people that, you know, might like to make sure that they get up and stretch at 10 a.m. or take a medication at 1 p.m., LEQ knows this and will actually prompt you to do those things. It also allows for FaceTime calling with uh, the touch screen. It can accept pictures from individuals and it will actually identify. So if you have an older person um, whose children might live in another state and they send a picture of a grandchild, LEQ will announce there's a picture of your granddaughter. So um, again, we're super excited about this. The $700,000 was in the state budget to pilot these. Um, we're gonna be able to distribute about 800 of them. So more to come. We've gotten a ton of press on LEQ as well. That was actually also hosted um, on the Today Show recently. And we're, we just issued a press release yesterday on the expansion of the project. Um, we also worked with the Virtual Senior Center, which is pioneered by Self Help, um, which is really what we like to call a senior center without walls. And so again, it's a little bit more in depth than the Get Set Up platform, but it provides an opportunity for older people to um, do a variety of things, social telehealth visits, uh, links to internet and games, recorded content and materials. And that has been very successful throughout the pandemic to support older people. And then we also got additional revenue to expand the stipend program for the long-term care ombudsman program. So again, the ombudsman program really falls on the shoulders of uh, volunteers, and this allows the state to actually incentivize them with stipend services to continue to provide that very important service. Next. So I wanted to talk about, you know, other state agencies that also re received additional funding that's going to help for aging services network. So um, again, we got a historic $20 billion investment in healthcare, which is, is really incredible. It's not exactly what we asked for as far as the direct support professionals, but it is very, very significant. Um, so you, you all are very well versed in the healthcare worker bonuses, um, but we also are looking at a multi-year investment in healthcare payment reform. Um, we're also looking at improving healthcare infrastructure, providing aid to hospitals who are struggling. A lot of the rural counties have vital access providers that are, are not doing well financially. And the last thing you want to do in a community is lose your healthcare provider. Um, and another $7.7 billion over the next four years to increase the home care worker minimum wage by $3. We're a little bit disappointed that we only got a $3 investment. We were actually looking to um, increase the wages of direct care workers to 150% of federal poverty, and we weren't able to obtain that, but a three-year increase is definitely significant. There's also a 25 billion five-year housing plan, and that really looks at creating and preserving about 100,000 affordable homes and really looking to support services for vulnerable populations. So about 300 million of that for senior housing um, is going to go to help older New Yorkers age in place, which again, we know is really, really um, important. We're also looking at the new property tax relief credit um, for eligible low and middle income uh, households. So many of you are very familiar with the STAR program and uh, they actually increased the benchmarks for those programs. So we're very excited about that. Next. Um, again, to increase coverage and affordability for older adults, this is extremely important for people that need home care services. The state budget actually raised the Medicaid income limit for New Yorkers 65 and above. Um, we're really, really excited about that. They've also increased for those with disabilities, and they've actually raised the income limit for the Medicare Savings Program. For those of you that aren't aware, there is a program available that will get you back your Medicare Part B premium, um, and they expanded the income guidelines for that significantly. So a lot of people are going to get, you know, a little less than $200 back every month in their monthly income. Um, we're also looking at the $250 million in funding for pandemic-related uh, eviction issues for low-income households, and we're also looking at the $1 billion for Connect All. This is really important to all of you. I've heard from counties across the straight state that really struggle with uh, internet access, and the plan for this is to really make sure we have broadband for all. Next. Um, before I go to questions, I just wanted to, to kind of tee up with all of you. We are currently working very, very closely on what has been uh, proposed for the next iteration of the 1115 waiver. Many of you know the previous waiver as the DISRIP program, um, which was about $8 billion. This current waiver is for um, almost $14 billion to basically change um, healthcare system and improve health outcomes. I will tell you that I am working very closely with numerous 
uh, payers at a state level on how Offices for the Aging can leverage the fact that they are doing all things regarding social determinants of health. So they're helping with nutrition, transportation, um, healthy aging, evidence-based programs. And so we are, are watching closely the waiver iteration, but the hope is that this will be another revenue generator for uh, Offices for the Aging throughout the state to assist them in the services that they're already providing. Thank you, Becky. We really appreciate your time today. It's fascinating some of these newer state-of-the-art programs that are available to our older populations. We currently do not have any submitted questions, so I want to thank Becky for her insightful presentation. If you have further questions for Becky, you can reach her at Becky at agingny.org, or you can call Becky at 518-570-6023 with any questions. Thank you everyone for taking the time to join this program. Again, if you'd like to review it or share it with another person from your staff, please visit nysac.org and click on webinars and look under the archived listing for today's date. Thank you and enjoy everyone's day.